Welcome to Leadership Reimagined, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. I'm Janice Elig, the CEO and founder of Elig Group Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search through our long-standing commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. On today's topic, CEO Spotlight, Performance with Purpose. I am delighted to welcome Kevin Strain, President, CEO, and Director of Sun Life Financial. Joining Sun Life in 2002, Kevin has held several senior roles, including his appointment in 2012 as President Sun Life Asia, in 2017 to Chief Financial Officer, and in 2021, President and CEO. With over 20 years of experience at Sun Life, Kevin leads with a commitment to inclusivity and a caring culture for employees and a purpose-driven mindset to help clients achieve financial security and live healthier lives. Kevin is currently a board director of Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, the University of Waterloo Board of Governors, and a member of the Asia Business Leaders Advisory Council. With so much happening in the markets today, Kevin, I am delighted you could join us. Janice, well, thanks for having me. It's really nice to be here and have a chance to talk to you. Great. So I wanted to start with the early years and how your grandmother had quite an influence on you uh, when she helped finance your university studies, which I understand is why you now provide student scholarships to those in need, and how your own experience shaped who you are today to give back financially, but also by advising young talent. Could you talk to us a little bit about that impact? Well, you know, Janice, first, thanks for that nice memory back of my my grandma. And I, I didn't even know that you guys had uh, known about that story. It uh, feels like a long time ago now, but I come from a, I'd say a very working class background and my parents couldn't pay for university. I was even able to get government grants up here in Canada, which, which was super helpful uh, along with some loans. But, you know, the first year is the hardest year. And um, I knew I wanted to do co-op because by doing co-op at University of Waterloo, I'd be able to pay for my my schooling by working during the, the school years. And my grandma and I were talking and she said, listen, I'm going to help you pay for your first year because you won't be you won't be working yet. I'd always work through high school. But that really gave me a boost so that when I when I graduated, I I was um, not under a, a mountain of, of debt and and able to kind of build my career in a way that that was you know more flexible than you'd be if you were under a, a mountain of debt and 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 to be quite honest I'm not sure if I could have even done it the first year if if my, if my grandma didn't give me that that money so when I'd always stayed in touch with the University of Waterloo that's where I'd gone to school and one of the things I always thought I could help with is is helping with students like like me who were you know, who were good students who who just needed that little boost to, to get a start and and talking to the school and talking about need and structuring something. We structured a, a couple of, I'll call them smaller grants, actually, to be honest, and, and that's sort of what my grandma gave me is smaller grants to get um, to get somebody started and into the into the program and where they can, you know, find, find a job and, and, and work and and pay for their schooling. So it was always something that said to me, you know, somebody wasn't there to uh to help you would you've been able to to do it and so if i can help a little bit uh there's three or four students i help each each year right now when you're helping these students financially what's some of the advice did you give them because they're embarking on their careers after graduation you know i try to tell the students first it's working hard putting the time in putting the effort in building connections building relationships can all be important to building their career not, I try to tell them not to focus just on one job, uh, but to build skills that can go into multiple directions because you just never know where life is going to take you. And if you focus on one job and there's somebody in that job, it it, it may never come to fruition or somebody else um, ends up getting a job you've been only focused on. So I try to tell them build skills, um, try to build different career paths through relationships, you know, be success, be successful, work hard and be successful. Success opens doors. That said, if you do things that fail, you know, learn from them and pivot. But there's no, uh, there's nothing better than than a bit of hard work to kind of make sure that uh, that things open up for you. And, 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 and you know, doing things well and, and uh, getting them right does does open lots of doors. You know, having failures isn't doesn't close the doors necessarily, it creates a learning opportunity. But it's, uh, I, I think that concept of working hard. The other thing I try to tell people is um, work on 
whatever is important to your boss and your boss's boss, because that's actually a way of getting noticed. It's also a way of getting to work on the things that are important to the to the company. And uh, when you work on those things that are important to the company and you do them well, that that really opens up lots of doors. So you know that's that's kind of the the lines of the advice it's uh, that I try to take with people. Yeah, and you know, you've sat in many seats there uh, over the twenty years, and you know, Sun Life's a very interesting company, and I'd like you to tell our audience more about it because I've visited your offices in Toronto, and I must say, you look more like a tech company than an insurance company. In fact, you are more than insurance, you know, so. Give us some information of the facts about Sun Life's businesses, its investment, asset management business, your MFS subsidiary, and your transformation that's been going on over the past decade. Yeah, well, first, thank you for saying that. I think that um, a bit of our office space reflects who we are. And I think a bit of what you're seeing in that tech company comment is, first, we value our people. We know that people really drive the company and drive the change, and they're really how we deliver on our on our purpose, we wanted an environment that was that was uh, collaborative, uh, that was professional, that was open, uh, that was bright. I mean, it was for Sun Life and that that sort of bright space. So I, I think the space represents itself, and some of what tech companies are trying to do with their space is is probably consistent with that. Um, so we wanted an environment that really pulled people in, and, and post COVID, that making the office a, a magnet is probably more important than it that it's ever been. So we're 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 really happy with our space and that that sort of space that you've seen in Toronto. You know, there's uh, we're mirroring in 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 Asia and in the U.S. and in other parts of of Sun Life, and we are a unique company. Um, we are close to fifty percent of our income comes from asset management and fifty percent from uh, the protection business. Uh, we have over fifty percent of our incomes coming from the U.S. And close to 20% is coming from Asia. So we're a truly global uh, company. In fact, we're in 28 different markets around the world. Um, we have close to 85 million clients now. And those clients are all around the world. We have uh, 50,000 employees around the world and 100,000 agents, advisors who distribute our insurance products. We're a very purpose-driven company. Um, as I was uh, resetting our strategy when I became CEO about a year and a half ago, um, one of the things we looked at, we said, we wanted to start right back at the purpose and say, does the purpose of the company work? Um, our purpose is, is helping clients achieve uh, lifetime financial security and to live healthier lives. Um, everybody I talked to said, don't touch our purpose. We, we, we love the purpose of this company. It's what brings us into the office. You know, if you think about millennials today, I can't believe how many of them join us because of our of our purpose. And one of the things that struck me as I was talking about that was everybody said, don't touch our purpose. So I started to say to them, okay, that's great. Tell me the client stories where we're actually helping them to achieve lifetime financial security and to live healthier lives. That got a little bit tougher. And, I, and, and it struck me that, you know, we want to be a, we want to just not just have a nice purpose. We want to be a purpose driven company. And that means creating client impacts and starting to measure client impacts. And so we're starting to measure um, both financial actions and financial impacts and health actions and health impacts. I recently put a fellow named Chris Way in as our chief client and innovation officer, and he's helping me around the world to make sure that we're uh, structured and have strategies to to deliver on our, our purpose. And so that concept, and if you think about that purpose, um, if it's it's if you think about what do you need to achieve lifetime financial security, you need protection. So life and health insurance is a really important component. You, but you also need wealth, right? You need to be accumulating wealth, and you need for a lifetime. You need ways of deaccumulating your wealth in retirement, and that's one of the things I, I love about Sun Life is our combination of being half asset management and half insurance having a big life insurance, health insurance, and wealth business positions us so well to deliver on our, our, our purpose. Um, we more recently in the last five years, six, seven years added uh, healthier lives. And we're doing more and more on the health space. Uh, that is really a nice adjacency to our insurance business. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, if, I, if I step back, 
that 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 purpose driven is really important. And then we kind of have three themes that I think are quite unique to us. And and the first is as a company that's half insurance and half asset management, how can we leverage that? How can we take our asset management expertise to make our insurance better, which largely is returns or or asset classes or products and what, how we offer them to our to our clients? And then how can we use that big big insurance business? to help seed the asset management business and help grow the asset management business and finding ways to create interactions. The, the second theme we're really focused on, on is um, thinking and acting like a digital company. And I think that talks to how you started this, Janice, in terms of mentioning um, how our office space looks. And we've been uh, running a project on, on digital enterprise to help us think and act like a, a, a digital, digital company. And then the third is we, we've really recognized that we need to do our part to be a sustainable organization. And sustainability to us uh, means helping people with their financial security, helping people live healthier lives, um, doing our part for sustainable investing and recognizing, you know, wanting to be part of the solution when it comes to climate change. And then also being a, a trusted employer, a st- trusted corporation, um, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. You mentioned this at the start of the podcast. Um, being being sustainable, having financial discipline, having a strong capital position. So there's a bu- bunch of elements, but that that real desire to do our part to be a sustainable organization also is part of who we are as an organization. This purpose, you know, you know driven mindset to help clients achieve financial security and live healthier lives, and then trying to measure that globally. That's not an easy task particularly since you are so global, this Canadian company, you know, doing business in Canada, Asia and US, but in terms of the sheer market size of the people you're serving, right? And then trying to measure, are you really achieving that financial security and living healthier lives? You're doing this in so many ways, but you're really trying to measure this. So how do you, how do, you do that given the complexities of you know, Sun Life's businesses, again, what you're trying to do in Asia, because you having lived there in Asia, you really are growing the business there, uh, I think more substantially than the US and Canada. Is that right? Yeah, no, you know, in, in some ways, there's more similarities than there are differences. If I think about, you know, clients at their very nature around the world, what are they, what are they trying to do? Um, they're trying to accumulate their wealth so that they can pay for their kids' education, so that they can Live a, a live a live a good life so that they can retire and and have enough funds in retirement. They're trying to protect their health. They're trying to protect their families from a, a life insurance perspective. They want to live healthier. That that's true. That's true in the U.S. That's true in Canada. That's true in every country we do business in Asia. So this concept of the purpose rings right across the the uh, the world. In fact, if if you think about um um. Lunar New Year in in Asia. I don't call it Chinese New Year because my wife's Vietnamese and they they call it Tet there, and it's Vietnamese New Year there. So it's uh, it's Lunar New Year. And if what you wish people, you wish for them long life, longevity, prosperity, and good health. That is actually the wish that you uh, send to people during Lunar New Year, and it's very tied to our purpose, right? And our purpose came out of Canada and the U.S. really more than than Asia. So there's a there's a similarity into what at the very core people need, there is for sure differences in culture and differences in where economies are and how developed economies are and how people use technology. And so there, there, there's a lot of differences, but in many ways, our purpose holds the holds all of that together. Um, and the concept of wanting impacts holds all of that together. So it's while it's complicated, we're in a lot of places, our purpose and then our strategy really make that um, really help us to deliver it. And one of the things that that I find is that we're able to leverage things that are happening in other parts of the world. If we weren't in Asia, we wouldn't have a view of where technology is going in Asia or what's happening from a client perspective or what's happening in their economies. Um, I, I, I tell people that um, Sun Life has been in business 150 years. We've been in Asia for over 130 years. For that 130 years, uh, technology that we used in Asia came from Canada. Uh, people that we needed to, to, 
to uh, to grow the business in Asia often came from Canada and the U.S. Um, the product ideas that we did in Asia often came from Canada and the U.S. The next 125 years, it's just math, right? <laughs> There's 3.3 billion people who live in the markets where we do business. The technology is going to come from Asia into North America. The product ideas are going to come from Asia into North America. And increasingly, we're bringing people from Asia over to North America or we're leveraging um, uh, service centers in, in India or in the Philippines to help on deliver service. So I actually think there's more advantages to being global than there are disadvantages from a complexity complexity standpoint. Mm-hmm. And, and as you were saying, you know, it's, it's interesting to not be in Asia. I, I think over the next, and it's going to take 10, 15, 20 years, both China and India will be two of the top three economies in the world. The U.S. will be the other mm-hmm. one. And I'm, I'm not going to say mm-hmm. who's one, two, three, but you know these will be the, the the three biggest economies in the world, and we have a strong uh, footprint in all three. And I think that's 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 really important. You know, as a Canadian company, you know, Canada has about 40 million people, uh, and we have eight to 10 million clients. The U.S. has 400 million people, and now we have close to 50 million clients. Think about what that means for Asia. If you just said, look at the number of people in the countries we do business in Asia, and you're looking at three, 400 million potential clients. I know our, our uh, president of our U.S. Um, business, Dan Fishbein, likes to joke with Jacques that he's got as many clients in the U.S. as there are Canadians. And I and Ingrid and I, Ingrid, who runs uh, Asia, are quick to tell Dan, someday that will be the case for Asia, too. Asia will have as many clients as there are Americans. And it's just the size of the opportunity, right? That's incredible. And so, therefore, really the cross-cultural impact that you're having, your employees have to really embrace for through that local lens, correct, in terms of what's needed. And so you, you sounds like you have a lot of people moving around the globe to service clients. In every country we do business, we try to have a local CEO. So if I looked across our Asian businesses now, the, the, the person who runs Hong Kong is from Hong Kong. The person who runs the Philippines is from the Philippines. The person who runs Vietnam was, was born in Vietnam. Uh, the person who runs Indonesia is from Indonesia. You know, so we, we've really tried to, same in India, China, right across. And, and then our distribution people and our operations people are also local. You know, understand the culture, understand um, uh, the regulators, understand the size of the opportunity, how to do business, how to motivate people there. And then we, we try to seed into smart roles expats who, who really come with deep sun life experience. And, and that's often finance, or actuarial, risk people, compliance. Um, they're on the management team and they bring that, that sort of balance. And then we also try to bring those local CEOs and distributions and product and operations people um, back into uh, the broader sun life for education times, for sharing, for understanding, for different different forums, and so you get that balance because you're absolutely right. There's no there's no clients in the corporate office. There's no clients in our regional office in Asia. The clients all exist inside of the inside of the businesses, and getting close to the clients and understanding the cultural differences and the cultural needs and how they use technology and what technology is available. We've just found that to be really important to being able to grow uh, across the world, but at the same time, bringing it back and then trying to leverage those things we're seeing, because sometimes you can see them in advance of the competitors by doing that. So I want to just remind our audience, you are listening to CEO Spotlight, Performance with a Purpose, Kevin Strain, Sun Life CEO, President and Director. The topics we cover like today's are all current and a new topic with a new game changer is released every month. This is a great way to stay current on relevant issues happening around us. Now let's return to Kevin Strain and talk further about the transformation that's been going on over the past decade at Sun Life, Kevin, and the some of the acquisitions that you've done, the number and the purpose, the strategy going forward with these acquisitions. Yeah, you know, we've we've had a programmatic MA strategy, which means, you know, as a company uh, for a number of years now, probably five to ten years, we've been we've been growing our capital organically at 
800 million to a billion per year. And we've been able to turn that 800 million to a billion per year into a programmatic acquisition strategy where we're we're looking for, we're really looking for acquisitions that either add capabilities that we don't have today, or they add scale in places that we need scale. So we've been very targeted at where, where we do m and It's got to either add scale or it's got to add capabilities. And then of course, it has to have financial discipline. It has to help us with our medium-term financial objectives. So it's got to be accretive to earnings. It's got to uh, add to the cash flow of the company, which of course supports our shareholder dividends. And it's got to um, ha- be accretive to our ROE, um, have an IRR that, that's in excess of what our ROE target is. And those are the, the, the three sort of financial measures we're looking at when we do acquisitions. If I step back and looked at the past uh, five years, we've been building out in Asia and in our alternative asset management business primarily, but we've done uh, some very targeted things and some big things in the US side, in the health business and in the health space. And we've done a few FinTech and health tech, smaller uh, acquisitions. So if I stood back and said in Asia, we, we had a number of countries in Asia which weren't at scale, um, partially because they didn't have uh, some of the distribution methods that were needed in those markets. So we weren't in bank assurance in every market and we weren't in agency in every market. And over the past five years, we've invested in bank assurance in, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, and, and now more recently in, in, in Hong Kong. Um, and that was building on our other sort of bank assurance relationships. And we extended some uh, bank assurance in the Philippines and, and did some additional work in, in Malaysia. Um, so we're really building out bank assurance capabilities and, and scale there. Um, it's interesting. When I took over Asia in 2012, uh, we were earning $100 million per year in underlying earnings. Last year, we were close to $675 million. Now, we had a reclassification of about $100 million. But if you, if you, if you looked at that over a 10-year period, uh, we increased uh, close to $500 million uh, off, of a, off of $100 million. That's a massive amount of value. Even at a 11 times earnings multiple, you're talking five and a half plus billion in value for Sun Life shareholders by building out in Asia. And a lot of that was built by organic growth, but a big chunk was built by M&A and having a focus on building capabilities and scale through that M&A. The second place we've been doing a fair amount of M&A is in the alternative asset management space. And we were, we are, we've owned MFS since the mid 1980s, a great asset management company, world, world known, world renowned uh, in uh, the public equities and public fixed income. But what we could see was that the alternative space, re- real estate, um, infrastructure, high yield credit, private fixed income were areas that were growing. And over the past five years, we've built out all aspects of that of that strategy, investing a, a significant amount of capital into growing the alternative space. And then more recently, we added uh, a company called DentaQuest um, into the US, which was our largest acquisition ever outside of Canada at $2.6 billion US and uh, immediately accretive, uh, immediately cash flow positive, uh, immediately uh, adding to the ROE of the company. So we're, we're really happy with that. And we've been adding investments into health tech and sure tech companies like Pinnacle Care in the US, which we now own totally, Collective Health, um, Dialogue here in Canada, which is a virtual care company. Uh, we're um, close to 50% owner of a health insurance company that's digital only in Hong Kong called Bowtie. So that programmatic approach is one where um, we've kind of never slowed, we've just never slowed down. We're always in the deal stream and we're, we're looking at adding those skills or capabilities. And that's, that's been adding uh, significant value. And, and one of the things I've been most proud of is, you know, during COVID, um, a lot of the past three years has been work from home. We did, we did as many, if not more m and activity with uh, doing it all virtually uh, as we were doing prior to that. So we were really able to keep that momentum on the, on the M&A side. So M&A is a tool um, and it's, it's one that 
we are really focused on building scale and capabilities in places that need it. Yeah, your insurance, your asset management, you're really digital. Tell us about a little bit about how important the partnerships that you've had globally in this growth. Yeah, you know, it's um, partnerships are are critical, especially in in Asia, especially if you enter into new markets. And we've been able to partner on the bank assurance side with some of the best banks in Asia. We have joint ventures in Malaysia, India, and in China. These partnerships have all been helpful for us in terms of uh, building brand and understanding the market and sometimes access to, to clients and uh, uh, really building our, our presence there. So the partnerships have been really important. You know, one of the things that we find if you're going to build an effective partnership, uh, there's a few things you have to do. One, select your partner very carefully. <laughs> it's the most important thing you can do is to partner with the right company. And so spending time, understanding the company, building relationships is the first and probably the most important thing you can do. The second thing you need to do is add value to the partnership. And you can see a lot of these partners that we're working with are big companies, don't necessarily need our, our capital a lot of the times, or other companies would just as easily come in with, with capital. What they want is they want expertise. They want uh, a, a strong relationship. They want some, a company that they can feel good about partnering with that's delivering value. And so making sure that we think about how do we add value, how do we bring value to the partnership, um, and how do we do that on a long-term basis so that it really is a long-term uh, relationship. So we, we think partnerships, particularly in Asia, are really important. And then if you look in, in our businesses in, in North America, we also have partnership. A lot of our clients are, are, are um, companies or plant sponsors. Those are really partnerships. Um, and finding ways to add value to their business and thinking about them from that lens and then bringing value to their employees uh, is is really important. So what is the culture like? How has it evolved? And how does your board have discussions around the table on DEI and measuring success in terms of sustaining a healthy, inclusive culture? Well, first, you know, we, we and, and, and Dan Fishbein, our U.S. Uh, president, sort of coined this phrase, we view culture is our superpower, right? It's, mm -hmm. it is I unique. It. I mean, there's, there's a lack of politics in this organization that a lot of, you don't see in a lot of places. This role of collaboration, uh, the role of innovation, I would say, um, the way that people work together, I think at the very core, having a, a, an optimism about the future and being optimistic about the future and trying to bring that optimism back. Um, we've, we've also tried to structure a meritocracy where, you know, the way we assess people and the way we look at succession and some of those types of things. And I think this is important. You know, we try to make sure we, we do it on the fundamentals of what people have accomplished and, and what they can do. So, you know, our, our culture, we really feel is, is unique. It's, it's often hard to capture it in a, in a few small words, but that, that comp, concept of partnership, collaboration. Uh, some people say nice and sometimes we can be too nice and it is it is part of our culture, but that optimism, lack of politics, uh, those have become really important. Um, I've always, and and even more so after going to Asia, b believed in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, if you're not representing um, the, the population around you, you're not getting the best people. Right. Like it's impossible in my mind that if you've got the best people, that half of your management team is a woman, that if you've got the best people, that your team doesn't look like, you know, the city of Toronto is a very diverse city that it, it, it ne we need to look like the city or we're not looking hard enough to bring in the best people. So the, to me, diversity, equity and inclusion is about making sure we build the strongest teams. It also has the advantage of bringing different points of view, especially for a global company like ours. And so, you know, if in Toronto, we can bring in somebody with a Vietnamese background, that eventually helps us with running our Vietnamese business because they understand the culture there and those types of things. So, so it, there's just so many advantages to thinking this way. And, and the, but the biggest advantage really is that the, 
the the strength of the team is 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 better. Um, it's not an easy part of the culture. It's something we have to work at. And in fact, it's it's I'm not where I would like us to be. So our goal is to be at parity for for men and women around the world, um, and to be at 25 percent underrepresented minorities in our North American businesses, both at sorry VP and above. Um, we've been leading from the top. Our board is at parity. Our board has the diversity, uh, has met the diversity requirements. My executive team's at parity for men and women. Uh, we've added we've added diversity to the executive team. Um, so we're leading from the top, but there's still work to do inside of the system. And one of the things that that tells me that, you know, we're working hard at it and we're still not at parity. So it it does show you that companies have to work at it. They have to structure it and it's it's in some ways it's unfortunate it doesn't it it doesn't just happen we we still need to work at it and that's and that's just a fact and so i think us having a goal and being committed to working at it is eventually going to build the best team that we could we could have you truly take to heart the analytics in terms of you survey your employees you look at all types of you know uh data out there about how your employees feel about working there. So you're really taking, making it a personal objective for you and the board, Kevin. I mean, that's what I hear you saying because you're not satisfied yet, but you are always out there listening to what your people are saying, even those who have left, right? So uh, I think that's the only way to kind of stay on top of it. So in that regard, tell us about your, because we're going to close shortly, and I want to know about your own personal leadership guidelines. What what you want to be known for, seen as by your colleagues, by your employees, your clients, really all constituents, because I know you're taking this, uh, you know, this, this purpose-driven organization to be delivering on the purpose very seriously to your employees and your clients. Yeah, you know, for me, it's really about, it's about client impact and delivering on our purpose. And, I, you know, that, it, it's just so important and it would be, it, it's, it's also, I think, a little different in our industry, right? So a lot of companies have the same idea and the same vision and, 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 it, and it sounds good in the same purpose, but where, where we're going to become different is where we're going to be recognized for actually delivering on that purpose. And if we can deliver on the purpose, we're fundamentally going to give our clients better lives, right? And they're going to find that we are value added to, to them. And so, you know, if I could do one thing, it would be really creating long-term impacts around both financial security and health. And we, we're building we're building strategies to to help deliver that. But in the end, that's that's the core. It's why I've added the chief client impact person at my executive team table with with Chris. The way you do that is strategy structure people. And I think our strategy is well set out to deliver on that. I mean, we know that digital is an important piece of that. We know that sustainability is an important piece of that. We know that having high quality distribution when you interact with the clients is an important piece of that. And we know that having financial discipline all surrounded by strong people, culture, and brand. And that's our, that's our strategy in a nutshell. And if, if, if with that strategy, I can see us delivering on the, on the purpose, the way we execute is having the right structure to do that and creating alignment in your structure, but then ultimately having the right people and culture to execute. And that's, that's, that's honestly um, where I've been spending my time. And, and if the other thing, if, if at the end of this, which is hopefully a long time from now uh, that um, I'm done, people would say, hey, we've also done an incredible job of developing the best people in the industry and that we're known for having the best people and develop the best people in the industry. So, you know, if I can deliver on our purpose and continue to develop our people, um, I think that'll put us in a really good place. I think that's your superpower, right? <laughs> it's your people in your culture and that will drive, you know, client satisfaction. Any parting words? Kevin's been a very insightful, informative discussion. So any parting words? For all CEOs, if, if they can really think about what is their purpose as a company and how does it impact all of their stakeholders and what does it mean for their clients? What does it mean for their shareholders? What does it mean for their communities? What does it mean for their people? And creating that strategy that aligns to your purpose and then finding ways 
to execute on it. That's that's why we're here as 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 businesses. Um, and the more that we can on the sustainability front, the more that we can continue to engage and all of us be part of that solution. I I don't believe in in um, putting people in and putting companies outside of saying they can't be part of the solution. So I think finding ways to engage all of us in 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 the economy, engage all of us in the change, engage all of us in making uh, the places where we do business better. Um, and I think as organizations, we can do that by having a strong purpose that's linked to a great strategy and development of our people. Yeah, and you and I talked a little bit before the program about a bit of bringing the world together to be a better place for all, right? And so as a CEO, you have that power with a purpose. And if everybody does that, we can maybe be a better world overall, correct? It's easier said than done. But you know, a, a lot of us know how to do this. And I think it's really staying dedicated to, to that and driving out that purpose. Well, Kevin Strain, thank you again for joining us today and sharing an incredible, a very exciting story about your growth and transformation. And we look forward to seeing that occur and reoccur in the future. This was a topic of CEO Spotlight, Performance with Purpose, with Kevin Strain, President, CEO, and Director of Sun Life Financial. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in for another game-changing conversation on Leadership Reimagined. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit our website at ellagroup.com. Thank you to Kevin Strain. Thank you to our audience. Thank you for joining us today. 